Lord God, we uh, thank you so much for this amazing day. And Lord, you've called us to be in sorrow ministry, to care for those who are struggling, who are hurting, who are searching for answers, for hope. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus, that we can represent you in some small way. We pray in our Lord that you would be with us now, that you would open our hearts and minds, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, fresh and new. We pray, pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Great to be here with you folks. Uh, as Georgette said, just recently ordained into the Anglican Network of Canada. I uh, was uh, actually uh, 30 years prior as a Lutheran minister, so... Uh, Kind of an interesting story there. I'll tell you that story sometime. But so excited to be part of the Anglican Church. Um, I'm also a, a pastor, but also a thanatologist. That means I spend most of my time talking about death, dying, and grief and studying this uh, subject matter and do a lot of speaking, a lot of uh, training across, uh, mostly across Canada. So happy to be in the States here with you folks. Um, I want to I want to just hopefully expand uh, a little bit of your understanding of grief and mourning today, and I feel like I'm going to be a runaway train here, honestly, like 35 minutes. So um, some if I'm going too fast, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll try to slow down as much as I can. Uh, I put a note sheet here that you can kind of take notes a little bit if you need to, but I'm willing to uh, answer any questions following as well. Uh, I want to define grief here. It's really important for me to define the grief the way that um, I understand it, um, because I think one of the difficulties often is explain to people what grief really is and what does it really mean. And Georgette said, be very practical here today. Give the folks some tools that they can take today and to use in their life and in their ministry, whether at home, in their own life, personal life, at work, in your church community. So I'm going to be very practical in my definition here. So there's two definitions that are really significant as we uh, think about loss and grief, especially in terms of as we go into understanding Joseph and the many colors of grief that he experienced. And the first definition here on page one is grief is your reaction to what you miss, to what you miss that you no longer have that used to be. Grief is your reaction to what you miss that you no longer have that used to be. You're missing something in your life that you never had. Makes sense. So you're grieving the fact that it's no longer in your life. But there's a second definition here that's really significant and really important, and I think one sometimes that we forget about, that we need to uh, emphasize here. The second definition is grief is your reaction to what you miss that you never had, that you never had, but always hoped for. Grief is your reaction to what you miss that you never had, but always hoped for. Examples, the child you can never have, a job that you never got, a marriage, that did not work out. Even sometimes this definition can be applied to somebody who has died. Let's say that there's a marriage and the marriage has not been that happy. Well, your grieving is a reaction to what you missed that you never had, that you always hoped for. You had hoped that it would have been better, but it wasn't. So you're grieving to that particular scenario. Now, I work a lot with post-abortion grief uh, in men, and when you think about these two definitions, you can see which one would apply. Grief is your reaction to what you missed that you never had, but always hoped for. That's the type of grief that they're working through as we take them back to that abortion experience. Two definitions are really important, but the very core grief is missing. As simple as that is, grief is missing. Grief is linked to loss. When something is lost, you want to find it. And that's where grief becomes so difficult because there's this tension that takes place, especially at the onset of grief, where you're pulled back into this grief thing that you miss, and you're trying to move forward into something that's different, and you're being pulled. You're being stretched. You're, you're, something's missing in your life. 
You don't know how to move forward. You don't know how to experience something different that God has for you, which is normal. So when you're ministering to others in the area of loss, you must ask this question of yourself before you're beginning to console others. It's such a simple question, but it's crucial. Ask this question. What is missing in this person's life that used to give them joy? What's missing in this person's life that used to give them joy? Jesus says our mourning turns to joy. Joy. There's something missing that's not giving us joy anymore. And when you think about those individuals who you're engaging, you need to discover what they're really missing, what's been taken away from them. This is where grief work becomes complicated because what's missing in a person's life is usually more complex than is actually what's on the surface. So we want to explore uh, Joseph and the many colors of his grief. And I took on a big thing here when I said I was going to do this topic and I realized, man, this is like an eight, eight session Bible study to give on this particular lesson. But I found some very fascinating things about Joseph that I think can help us understand, again, the complexity, but the vastness of the grief and loss that this man experienced, and perhaps some that you can identify with in your life, in your circle of influence. So I want to begin by reading this scripture from Genesis. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. So they just threw him into a pit. Then they sat down to eat. They sat down to eat, really? The brother's in the pit. They sat down to eat. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Israelites coming from Gilead with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin on the way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Joseph said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and lay, not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifted him out of the pit, and sold him into the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. Okay, listen, this is an unbelievable scripture here, because here is Joseph thrown into the pit, his brothers are having supper, and he doesn't know what's going to happen next. And finally, they give him away. Think about all those things all of a sudden that Joseph would have been thinking about which he would now be missing in his life that he once had. All those things that would be lost because of this one experience of being taken away from him. Think about it. Once belonged to a family. No longer. Once he was a brother. No longer. He used to have his dad. No more. He once had a physical home. Nope. He once had a culture. Done. He once had a shared faith, a religion, maybe corporate worship. No longer. Maybe he had to leave friends. Maybe he had to find role that he had to give up. Maybe he once was part of a community that was no longer there. You see how many losses are occurring in this is one particular example. And when you think about the people you engage in your life, they're going through a ton of losses, some uncovered, some deeper, some that you don't know of. But there's a question that Joseph is asking, which is at the core of his missing. We ask it too when we've experienced loss. And this question is, who am I now? Who am I now in relationship to what I no longer have? Once was a parent, maybe no longer. Once had a job, I don't have it anymore. Once I was a spouse, it's taken away. Who am I now? Joseph was on this incredible journey of discovery, wasn't he? He had to come to terms with what he had lost. And it was kind of through the ups and downs of his experience in Egypt that he was led back to what was missing in his life 
that was most important. Something deeper, the deeper story here. I mean, those things became paramount importance. Ripple effects for future generations, didn't it? His losses impacted the nations of Egypt and Israel for the good throughout all history. There was something missing in Joseph's life along the way too. Even though he had discovered a different life, something significant was happening to him that needed to be shared. The story needed to come out for him to continue God's purpose for his life, which is really a definition of mourning. Tension movement back into life that is different, not the same, something different that God has for all of us. One of the most important concepts for me in understanding grief and mourning is again that grief is not something that you just complete. It's not linear. Grief is cyclical in nature. Grief always comes back. Grief might lighten over time, but grief will come back because what you miss, do you want to get rid of? If grief is your reaction to what you're missing, will it ever be complete? My first wife died at 49 years of age. I don't want to get over missing her at times in my life. She's still an important part of my journey, part of my story. But grief will come back. And you know what? Grief came back to Joseph also. It did. That which was missing in his life came back to speak to him dearly. Let me give you an example of this. I'm married now again. God blessed me with a wonderful wife. Second time around, twice blessed. And a few years after we were married, we were in Hawaii enjoying a holiday time together. And we were sitting on the beaches during brunch listening to two men play ukuleles. Always romantic. Beautiful event. They started playing this song. And the tears began to roll down my eyes. It was a song from the Muppet movie, if you remember that, called The Rainbow Connection. And the first time I ever heard that song being sung was a day that I went to this concert where my first wife, Pam, was singing it as a solo in a small group. And I said to myself when I looked at her and heard her sing like an angel, I'm going to marry that girl. And I did. But now I was no longer married to that girl, but I was for 25 years, and the grief came back. The missing came back. And my wife, Erica, who's amazing, uh, we call these Pam moments. So you're having a Pam moment, which means that something's happening in my heart that she needs to understand. And I said, yeah, she said, good, just let it sit. And it sat there for a while, and then she asked the question, Tell me about that song, Rick. And I shared the story. And then we went on and experienced our day. But I had the opportunity to tell the story, to share the grief that was in, to be connected back to that moment, which was significant and important. And that's okay. And Joseph experiences the same thing. I mean, it's what a story. Talking about identities, trying to figure out who he was. He goes into Egypt and he's given this special place in Potiphar's house. You know, treats him like a son. You know, that's what he, that, that's what he's missing is kind of coming back, right? I kind of have maybe like a father figure again. And I'm, I'm a son. I'm given a family and I'm part of a culture. And of course, he maintains his relationship with God, which is the cool part of the whole story. But he's being integrated into a new culture. It seems like things are working out really well for him until Potiphar's wife steps in and gets him into big trouble. And you know the story. That Hebrew that you brought, he doesn't really have an identity there. He's still the Hebrew back there. Look what he's done. And he gets thrown into prison. Talk about loss again. First of all, he's taken away from his country. Now he's taken to a new land, starts to develop some type of identity of who he is, and he's thrown into prison again. That's a double loss. Okay, 
Now I don't have a dad again. Now I don't have a family. Now, see what happens? Now we know from scripture that he spent at least three years in that prison because after the cupbearer was released and the baker, remember the story, because of the dreams, he remained three more years to think about things. <laughs> I'm thinking, he's thinking about really hard things. I'm thinking about what he misses that he no longer have that used to be, which is grief. And he's wondering what his future is really going to look like. Will it be different? Is that kind of a picture of what we go through when we're going through grieving? What's it going to be like now? What's my life going to be? Is it going to be different? And then this amazing, amazing thing happens. Grief returns, but it changes his life. His brothers come. His brothers come because there's the famine. And they meet Joseph. They don't know who Joseph is, but they come to meet him because they need food. And we read this big change taking place in Genesis 45. Joseph could no longer control himself in front of all of his attendants. So he declared, everyone, leave now. So no one stayed with him when he revealed his identity. Who am I now? Who do I want to be? He revealed his identity. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians and Pharaoh's household heard him. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm Joseph. He doesn't give his, his Egyptian name. Oh, by the way, he was given an Egyptian name, an Egyptian wife, when he went back to be with the Pharaoh. But he doesn't give that name. He doesn't say, I'm this. He says, I am Joseph. And the first question he asks is a powerful question because it's what he's really missing in his life. Is my father, my father still alive? Reaction to what I miss that I no longer have that used to be. Grief is your reaction to what you miss that you always hoped for but was never had. Is my father still alive? His brothers could not respond because they were terrified before him. And Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me. And they moved closer. He said, I'm your Brother, man, I didn't think he'd want to be a brother to those guys who threw him into the pit. I'm your brother. This is who I am. The one you sold to Egypt tells him the story. Now don't be upset and don't be angry with yourselves that you sold me here. And then he tells the whole story of what happened. Reminds them of the significance of the story and gives them hope for the future. And the end of the scripture is that he cries. He weeps. His brothers were finally able to talk to him. You know, what you miss always begins with remembering what you had that's still significant in your life, that you need to share stories that are significant, that name you, that claim you, that mold you, that are part of you. And that story of Joseph is powerful for us to think about in terms of how we engage people in stories, how we help them remember. A lot of grief work is about remembering and helping people to remember what they miss, what identified them, what makes them special, what makes them who they are and what God has different for them now. Isn't it powerful to think that God had something different for Joseph? He didn't even know about it. He had something different for him. I love this whole aspect of remembering. In the story of Joseph, it's really simple. He tells him who he is. I'm Joseph. He tells him what he was like. I'm the one that you sold into Egypt. He tells him the significance of the story with him. Actually, it's not your fault. It was God's decision that I get placed here for your sake. And then he tells them more. He's connecting them to what was missing in their lives too. He celebrates what's for them. He wants to reconnect with his father. I want to see my dad again. 
that which is missing in my life. You know, that that tattoo lady that I had up on the screen there kind of shocked me a little bit, actually. I was doing a workshop, and and, uh, I was talking about the importance of remembering and the telling of the story in order to connect us with that person again. Because we need to honor the stories of missing in our life, because God is part of that. And so she came up to me after a lecture I gave, and uh, she was wearing that shirt, and she pulled it down, and I was... (laughs) kind of surprised me a little bit. She said, I want to show you this. And I went, oh, okay. And uh, I said to her, well, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's nice. Kind of, I was kind of red, actually, a little bit. And then I said, well, what was his, what was, no, it's my grandson. And I said, well, what was his name? Well, it was Ben. And then I said, well, what was he like? He says, well, I love Ben. He's such a good kid. He used to go fishing. And he used to take me to go fishing, she said to me. And we had great, great times together as we went fishing. I said, that's great. And he said, yeah, I wanted to remember Ben. And so what I did was I got a tattoo. And you didn't see that tattoo there, but it's a tattoo of a fishing rod with a heart through it and Ben's name in it. She's a 65-year-old grandma with a tattoo right here of her grandson because she wants to remember him as a significant part of his life. And I said, well, how do you remember him now? She said, I go fishing. And every time I go fishing, I remember how special he was to me. In some magic way, she said to me, we connect. We connect because I get to remember his story. The power of story and grief work is so significant and so important. And you may think the strategy is like too simple, but it's not. It's hard because we don't always ask these questions because in grief ministry, often we want to tell people what to do. We want to tell them our experience instead of listening to their experience, instead of listening to their story to find out what's missing in their life, to develop that relationship of trust. That's what we did with that guy in the bar, in the pub. You know, he became one of my very best friends. It was really sad when he left that town. Result of that conversation, he he said, man, I want to read your books. I said, okay. But I mean, the books are filled with God. That's what I do. I do God stuff. And so all of a sudden, the conversations that began with my son has cancer, the story of his pictures began a conversation of, I wonder what eternity is like. Hey, Pastor Rick, what do you think Jesus thinks about me? I wonder if I can have what you talked about in that book called Eternal Life. It began with story began with engaging somebody in their story so that we can then tell the next story. We don't start with the story of Jesus in grief all the time, do we? We start with the story of life, of their experience, of their loss, of their hurt, and then tell them the story about Jesus, if given that opportunity. Jesus got the power of story. In the road to Emmaus, This is a beautiful story of grief and loss and engagement. Picture this. I don't want to make sure I go too far. What time do I got to? 15? Okay. So here's the story. Um, Jesus um, is concerned about his disciples missing him. Don't think he isn't. He is. I mean, the disciples had this amazing relationship with them for three years, day in, day out, spending time with them. A lot of what Jesus did in those final few chapters of John especially was prepare the disciples for them missing him physically in their life. They didn't want him to go. I mean, Jesus, I got got to go. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. I'm going to leave you guys. And Peter says, no, no, you're not going to go. And Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. 
I'm going. I'm going to die, you guys. Jesus said, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in, in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. I'm preparing a place for you to go. Jesus spent so much time preparing his disciples for that time that he wouldn't be with him physically. And even though we know that the Holy Spirit comes and fills us, our heart, we have the presence of God, I'm talking about the physical presence of Jesus with these 12 disciples. He was preparing them for their leaving. So here it is, the road to Emmaus. Jesus comes back and he engages these two disciples on the road. And listen to this. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And talking with each other about all these things that had happened, while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? Okay, this is the key here. He asked them, What things? Are you serious? What things? Jesus wants them to tell him his story. What things? What things? He wants them to tell them the story. And so he begins to flesh out this story, the disciples, of what Jesus of Nazareth, what he did, the priest, the suffering, the dying, what he was going to do. He enters into a story about himself with these disciples. And then at the end, he vanishes. Man, if Jesus wants his story to be told, it's okay for us to have our story told. It really is. And we have to hear the stories of people's hearts, of their lives, the significant stories that are not only on the surface, but are deep down in their lives that they need to be told. You understand this, being involved in this ministry, the stories, the abortion stories, that have been pushed down, covered over, pushed aside. I make it a practice in my life to ask people. I do a lot of ministry in the bar, not because I'm drinking all the time, <laughs> although I do like the odd pint, but I do a lot of ministry in the bar and the coffee shops because I love what happens there. I love what happens there. And one of the questions I ask people now as I engage them, I know it sounds crazy, but as people come to me, because people know me as a pastor, so I just kind of sit there and wait to see what God does and who he brings. And, uh, well, you know God, he does. He brings people. And it's usually people, hey, uh, maybe you should talk to a, a, a Pastor Rick. He's over in the corner there having a pint. And I have friends bringing friends over. And it's always because they have something deep on their heart. And you know one of the questions I ask them all the time? is crazy, I know. But I do ask people now, have you gone through an abortion experience? Because if almost 25% of people have gone through it, then that means one every four people in that pub have gone through it. And think about the conversation I have. I'm not going there to judge them on the experience. I'm going there to engage them in their story so I can hear the grief in their life, so I can lead them, hopefully, through the Holy Spirit to discover Jesus. Discover Jesus. Story is so significant. It's so important. And we need to help people to remember those stories, to bring them closer to our Lord. And it doesn't matter who it is in your life, your neighbor, your friend, your co-worker. They have stories that need to be told. The formula is really easy. And people talk about death stories, especially, if, I love it. When people say, I've lost a loved one, or somebody has died in my family. I mean, it's great you can say, I'm sorry for your loss, but think about it. Wouldn't it be better to say, what was his name? 
What was he like? Why was or she significant to you? <coughs> Tell me more. You see how that leads to deeper conversation that can be impactful for the Lord? Jesus got this. In the Last Supper, he put into place something pretty significant. And we know it as a sacrament. But I find it amazing because Jesus knew that his disciples were going to miss him. What does he do? He puts into place something. He knew his disciples were going to grieve his physical uh, loss. He wasn't going to be with them. So he says, I'm paraphrasing, every time you guys get together, I want you to remember me. Story. And what I want you to remember about me is that, well, take this cup, take this bread, drink and eat, and remember that I died for you. That's the significant story for them. I'm not going to return again until the end. But in the meantime, do this. Okay, guys? Do this every time you get together. Jesus understood the power of story too. And I really believe that for you and I, Joseph teaches about the colors of grief. For sure, there's a lot of loss that's happened in his life. There's something deeper that needs to be discovered. And that was his one thing that was missing in his life. A connection back to his father. And let me ask you a question. Isn't that what everybody's missing? Who doesn't know the Lord? A connection back to the father? And that's our goal, to be involved in sorrow ministry, to hear the story, but to share the message of a God who loves us, of a God who gave his one and only son to die for us, who sent the Holy Spirit to live with us, to forgive our sin, and to give us a place called eternity. That's the beauty of being involved in grief or bereavement ministry. But it all begins with the story and the questions. What was his name? What was he like? Tell me more. Tell me more. Oh, man. Okay, I'm... We actually have till 2.40, it turns out. He started early, I think. What? And I'm just flying, flying like a crazy train here trying to get it through this.